Good morning, everyone. It's uh, Friday morning at Davos, so uh, a lot of people are still getting home at this, at this time right now. Some others are waking up, but uh, we appreciate the fact that you're here and, and, and of course, that, that we have an amazing panel um, to talk about an important issue. Uh, my name is Enrique Acevedo. I work for Univision and Fusion in, in the US. Um, we are the largest Spanish language network in the country and on many nights, the most watched broadcast network in the country, regardless of language which in a way is a statement about immigration and the power of immigration in, in the case of the US. Um, we're gonna talk about immigration uh, today, uh, an issue so divisive that it shut down the US government just last week. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen people migrate from, uh, from their homes uh, due to economic opportunity also, the, in, uh, you know, in cases they're forced to, to immigrate from their countries because of uh, political turmoil, climate change, and, and, and conflict, among many other reasons. Um, I was looking at the statistics, and around 3.5% uh, of the world's population lives in a country that it's not the country where they were born. So a quick show of hands here in the audience and, and also on our panel. How many of you live in a country that is not the country where you were born? So I'd say around 60% in our panel, it's 90%. Um, and, and well, I'm also an immigrant. So uh, it's an issue close to everyone's heart here. And, and, and I think it's an important issue to discuss, especially at a time where nationalism and populism are, are on the rise around the world and, and the role that immigration has had in fueling both of those uh, dynamics. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. You know, when we do television panels, they usually ask you to be very quiet and still. I'm not going to do that. You can you know, be part of this conversation. We're going to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, we were planning to do a poll, but we're going to wait until more people get here. So it's, uh, I don't want to say statistical, a statistically valid, but at least we have a, a good uh, show uh, for, for the results. And, um, and I'll also introduce each of our panelists uh, when, when we do uh, an introductory round. Um, so Ronald Reagan uh, was actually responsible for, for, a, for a phrase that's become really famous now, make America great again. And we'll hear about that in a few hours here at the forum. But he, was, uh, he also said something that I think it's important and relevant to our discussion. He said that in America, our origins matter less than our destinations. And that in that sense, immigration is crucial to democracy. So my first question for Alicia, Alicia Barcena Ibarra from uh, the UN uh, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean is, is immigration a threat to democracy? Or is it, is it something that actually helps democracy uh, grow and then, and, 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 you know? Uh, well, I, I definitely believe that uh, immigration, when it's good migration and, and, and order migration, it, can contribute enormously to democracy and contributes particularly to diversity. I think that that's something that is extremely important. For example, in Latin America, we have 30 million people living out of their original countries. You were asking how many people here. We're talking there 30 million people in Latin America out of 600. And, but the majority of them, 20 million, are in the US. Right. Of which 11 million are illegal. So what I would like to say is that when migration is illegal, then the status of migration is different. And now the, those migrants feel very threatened because they feel that they are going to be returned home and it has become an issue, a political issue. And uh, actually my view and the view of the UN, I would say, is that migration can be really a contribution to, to, to democracy, to, to development, and that's why currently uh, the UN is working on a global compact on migration that is going to be probably ready by the end of this year to be presented to all the heads of state of the UN to see if everybody can agree on this order, well-managed migration compact in the world because it's extremely important. And here we have Bill Wing, Swing, who is uh, the head of the International Migration Organization with whom we are working very closely precisely what we, what we do in the UN is we try to understand migration and the contribution. For example, 
migrants in the U.S. return back <coughs> remittances to Latin America up to $78 billion a year. And we'll talk about that with the president of Western Union, who's uh, uh, bringing the business perspective into our discussion today. But I wanted to ask Alejandro Ramirez, uh, the CEO of Cinepolis, uh, one of the biggest cinema companies in the world, about uh, this idea of immigration and democracy. You come from a state, Michoacán, in Mexico, that um, produces a large percentage of the migrants that uh, go to the US. Uh, so you leave this close, close to home. Uh, your thoughts about this, uh, this uh, link between immigration and democracy and what it can do for, for a country that, uh, that's losing all this human capital? Well, I think um, Alicia alluded to the contribution of immigrants to diversity, and, and I would like to uh, point that uh, through that diversity also, uh, immigration contributes positively to economic growth through increases in productivity and innovation. Um, and there's uh, evidence that suggests that uh, countries that are more open to immigrants grow more. Uh, there's a recent IMF study that uh, shows evidence that countries uh, that are open to immigrants uh, on average grow uh, for um, each uh, additional point of uh, uh, immigrants in the la labor force, mm -hmm. they, they grow up to 2% more in, in the long run. So uh, and this is a, you know, an, an econometric uh, multivariate analysis, so very, very rigorous. So uh, it shows you know, across you know, uh, tens of countries, uh, this evidence. So, um, and, and, it, and it's quite obvious for you know, CEOs. Uh, we employ um, uh, people from all over the world. You know, I employ over 40,000 uh, people in my company, and I have people from every Latin American country, from the US, from England, from um, Spain, uh, from India, from, uh, from Arab countries. And, and I see how that diversity in my workforce enriches my company and, and allows us to be more innovative, more dynamic, to understand better every market. And just like it, it works for firms, it works for, for countries. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna bring in uh, Kree Yang. She's, um, well, she describes herself as an as a entrepreneur, but a serial entrepreneur. But um, your story is just amazing. And you represent the voice of uh, a million undocumented youth in the US, um, the so-called dreamers, yeah. uh, who, by the way, are in the front pages of, of, of the news today uh, in the US. So no pressure. <laughs> but I did want to ask you about um, you know, your, 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 your experience and, and bringing that experience into the conversation as someone who immigrated to the US when you were 13 years old? 13. Just a couple of weeks before 9-11? Correct. And then went through a 10-year process of becoming a, an authorized immigrant in, in, in the US. So I, I'm really honored to be amplifying the voice of 800,000 undocumented uh, DACA students um, who are in this very difficult place currently due to what's going on with the policy changes. And in my case, I came to provide different perspective. Uh, I immigrated to the United States two weeks before 9-11 happened from a island called Vanuatu. And it's in South Pacific near Fiji. Uh, it was very surreal because um, a immigration process that really should have only taken three months actually ended up taking more than 10 years to get processed as a result of the circumstances. And I hear a lot of myth after working through this process um, of trying to understand how can we go about surviving and staying in a country where my parents are, where my family is, who had officially uh, invited our family to the country. And navigating that process was very challenging, but at the same time uh, helped me realize how many people really realize the importance <coughs> of investing in youth. And in my case, um, I was very fortunate to have a lot of mentors and counselors and people who, who wanted to provide that um, safe heaven for children who they knew that was going to be the future labor force. So what I do uh, uh, through, what I have done through the uh, Los Angeles Junior Chamber of Commerce as well as a uh, company that I have founded for social entrepreneurs was to uh, work with all these immigrant uh, immigrant entrepreneurs who basically provided more jobs for people in the United States, representing the country in other parts of the country, doing social entrepreneurship and bringing social goods. So I, I'm here to 
uh, provide a different perspective from the people that I have met outside of California. And so I'm very happy to be here. Today. And, and just an interesting fact, uh, Kiri hired around 100 workers while she was undocumented. <laughs> yes, so you know, that, that's also something we should be looking at, that how not only uh, immigrants contribute to the community, but to you know, uh, the creation of jobs and, 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 and wealth. Um, Hikret Ersek, the president and CEO of uh, Western Union, you, you uh, lead a company that thrives on the power of immigration in many ways. <coughs> uh, so you have a unique perspective, a business perspective about immigration from the US as an immigrant. Uh, your mother was Austrian, uh, and, but your father was Turkish, right? That's, that's and I'm married to an Indian, so. <laughs> <laughs> and live in the US. Your daughter lives in Germany, so yeah, that's. I'm not unique, by the way. Many of the Fortune 500 CEOs like me are immigrant background, so it's not, you know, and obviously there is something if you come with a global background, you do have a certain edge, you do work hard, you have a global understanding, and actually you do understand the customer needs. But just to, before I start sure. to, you know, just to complete your own, Reagan. Uh, quotes. He also said, "Tear this wall down." So you know, just maybe to remind <laughs> everyone here. <laughs> and you know, the last wall I know was, uh, you know, the two histories went was one is the Chinese wall, Great Wall, and one was Berlin Wall, and both are, you know, didn't hold for a longer term. So I think walls, uh, you know, especially in the world like where we live, where the digital connection, especially with young people like you, where it's, you know, people are connected, where everything is communicated. It's hard to, to stop people uh, around the world <clears throat> not to immigrate and not to contribute to the economy they arrive. In fact, you know, global remittances are about $600 billion. It's the, probably the largest foreign direct investment happens every year. If that wouldn't happen, the world will be in a different world, a different uh, you know, situation. And the, I just want to change also some perception. The immigrants, they come, they drive the, not only the economy of the country, but they also, 85% of their earnings stay there. Right. They send only 15% back home. And that's $600 billion worldwide. And I can see that daily in 200 countries, um, happening constantly and um, immigrant contributions about 9% of the global D GDP. If that wouldn't happen, our GDP, global GDP growth will be 5% less. Wow. And this is something that we don't see it on day to day. And actually we play defense here instead of offense. Mm -hmm. We always want to um, talk about our rights, immigrant rights, instead of uh, telling them what we can do. And it's not something like we are taking away, we are giving actually. And this offensive um, contribution, I like this panel because I'm looking forward to learn from this panel also what we can do, be play, play more offense than having, you know, already saying that we are here but. <laughs> and I want to avoid that word but. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Ersek. Um, this is our fifth year collaborating with Davos on, 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 panel, on panel discussions. And uh, something we've learned throughout the years is that sometimes a discussion gets lost in policy data. And we never get to see the human side of the things that we, we discuss here in Davos. Um, we have an amazing artist with us today. I actually just learned your, your last name today, Platon, because I, I, I've known you like Prince and Cher, that <laughs> was from, from your first name. Platon, a uh, photographer, the founder of the People's Portfolio, an amazing artist again. And he's here, he's here to provide that human perspective about what we're discussing today about immigration, the, the human stories, the lives affected by the policy, the data that, that, that we are debating today. Um, and I know you wanted to share the story of Evelyn. So um, what, what an honor it is to be amongst my friends here. Um, my role is to humanize the data. I have heard so many amazing people talk about policy and analyzing information, but uh, I'm always interested to find out you know, who, who, who is represented by this data. So uh, I began a project uh, a few years ago when immigration, believe it or not, was not discussed in America. Uh, it wasn't discussed on Capitol Hill. The press didn't really want to deal with it. But I kept hearing that if you are a family in the front line of this problem 
and you're being torn apart, it's a huge news. It's, it's a big deal. So I uh, decided to go and investigate, and I went to, I crossed over America, I went to the border, um, and one day I was in Arizona uh, at a march, a pro-immigration reform march, and I saw a mother marching with her daughter. Uh, her daughter was three years old, and her name is Evelyn. And she was beautiful, this little kid, right? So uh, the little girl was wearing a white T-shirt with hand-painted letters on it saying, Free My Dad. So I went up to the mother, and I was just amazed by the idea of this image because it sums up how complicated the whole issue of immigration is. This little girl is a citizen. Her father is not a citizen. He was an undocumented worker, and he was now in a, a waiting deportation. So uh, the family was being ripped to pieces. Um, so I said to the mother, excuse me, here's Evelyn. I said, can I take a picture of your daughter? And she said, yes. So I pointed the camera to the daughter, and she got spooked by, my, by me, this strange man with a camera, just like my kids would, and she hid behind her mother's legs. Now, that is not the picture I wanted to take. I didn't want to photograph her as a victim, frightened on the run, because when I saw her in the march with her mother, she was marching for dignity and pride. So I had to earn the trust of this little girl by playing balloons with her for five and a half hours. <laughs> now, let me tell you, I have never had to earn that kind of trust working with Obama, Trump, Putin, any of the world leaders I've had the privilege to work with. But this little girl, I had to earn that trust of empowerment. And after five hours, she says to me, picture. <laughs> so I took the picture, because I had now graduated, and, uh, and it was an amazing... I was very proud of this picture. She doesn't look frightened. She looks like she wants the world as a dignified, empowered human being. And then I turned to her mum, and I said, you know what, you should be really, really proud of this little girl because despite all the powerful people I've worked with, I think this is one of the most important pictures I ever took because I think it's going to help people understand this problem. And the mother then turns to Evelyn and she says, um, the photographer's very happy, you did good. And then Evelyn says, if I did so good, does that mean daddy can come home? Thank you, Platon. Um, we, we started talking about immigration, and we discussed some of the economic components of, of the debate. But during the 2016 campaign, which I covered for Univision, I, you know, I understood there were these economic frustrations, jobs, wages, <clears throat> trade, and what that did to a large segment of the population in the US. But what about the cultural and social issues behind immigration and, and the demographic anxieties it's, it's causing in, in some of the countries that are getting uh, this influx of, of immigrants. Um, you know, President Trump would go into one of the rallies and he would talk about, again, trade, globalization, and all these issues, all these economic issues, and people would pay attention, but as soon as he mentioned the wall, they were crazy. They would chant, build the wall. Mexico will pay for it. That was a strong narrative for the campaign, and one that won him the nomination on a very talented field of 16, uh, Republican uh, presidential hopefuls, but, but that also ended up winning him the campaign. He outflanked everyone on immigration. So let's talk about a little bit about the social and cultural aspects of, of this debate and, and, and the demographic anxieties discussing in a country like, like the U.S., Mr. Erzak. Well, you know, what we do is always we show U.S. and Europe as an example, but immigration is not only the building the wall is not a U.S. issue. It just came back from right. South, South Sudan, Uganda, country like Uganda, which has a few million people, are hosting about 1.2 million immigrants on all Uganda. And that's an issue. What they have done, though, they issued immediately work permit for South Sudanese. So South Sudanese can be it's integrated immediately in Ugandanese uh, society, which helps a lot. So one thing we should really put away is that it's not an, it's not a US issue. It's not a new issue. Immigration was always there, and it's going to go more, especially given the climate change. One thing is uh, going to happen that the people are going to move for better opportunities. 
some statistics or, you know, I know, I don't know, and I'll put it also in a human way. Let me put it in a human way. <laughs> Japan is getting older. Europe is getting older and they are not getting kids. They are not producing kids. Africa by 2050 will double the population. And it's the, what we are talking here is really the distribution of wealth and distribution of our human wealth worldwide in a fair way. And if you don't take care about that, this issue will never stop, um, stop and it's gonna, uh, it's gonna continue. One other thing I would like to mention is that, you know, if you are a European politician or US politician, you got four years. How do you win the next ele election? You need to have populist slogans to win the next election. And immigration issue won't be solved immediately. It's a long-term issue. So what you do is that you choose a slogan which is easy to argue, which has no defense. The immigrants have no lawyers. The immigrants have no flags. The immigrants have no national interests. The immigrants have no ambassadors. The immigrants have no um, representatives here, except us maybe, who raise their voice, who has legal rights. And the easiest way to win an election is to go after them instead of to, you know, getting the real issues. And I think that's a big uh, thing that it's not on, it's happening globally and we should put that in a global perspective. It is, and in a way, Alejandro, um, we mentioned this at the beginning, it seems immigration is feeding this uh, rise of nationalism and populism around the world. Not only in the US, you're right, even in, in countries with strong economic growth, Absolutely. like Germany, like Holland, like Denmark, for example. No, totally right. I think um, uh, one of the uh, uh, key problems is to, to understand uh, why politicians find it so um, uh, easy to, to target uh, the immigrants, as was mentioned. And I think it's because a lot of the uh, job displacement that we're seeing in every economy and, and in the advanced economies, uh, due to uh, technological innovation and technological disruption, it's easier to blame on an immigrant than on a robot. You know, you can say, this Mexican immigrant is taking your job, this Polish immigrant is taking your job. It's very hard to say, well, a new automated process in the plant has, you know, displaced a couple of hundred uh, uh, workers. So uh, it's very easy. And I think, uh, you know, to your point about uh, uh, President Trump's rallies during the campaign, uh, I mean, there's evidence that net migration from Mexico has dropped over the past 10 years. Uh, in fact, uh, today, there's one million less uh, unauthorized immigrants from Mexico than 10 years ago. And uh, this is due to all, both economic growth in Mexico and, um, and just there's been a, a negative uh, flow of migrants. I mean, more Mexicans go back to uh, to their uh, country of origin than that go in every year. And yet, you know, the rally was build a wall as, as if, you know, that was the problem, you know, displacing American workers, which is not true. It's, it's really, uh, and many studies attest to this, is really due to uh, technological innovation and disruption. Um, Can I add something? Can I on, Oliver, sure. Yeah. Sorry, just, uh, uh, just if, you know, you are absolutely right. What we see is now, that uh, Mexico is getting an outbound country. Mexico is attracting actually immigrants to Mexico from South, let other Latin American uh, countries, and they are sending back from Mexico home to Peru and other countries remittances. So you're absolutely right, it's changing. Uh, Alicia, you wanna say something? Yes, I wanted to say something. I think that, the, that what, what's happening today, and yesterday actually, is that President Trump is saying, Mexico has to pay for the wall and, and we, want 20, uh, we want 25 million uh, do, I mean, mm -hmm. dollars for the wall. Right. And we will then give a chance to 1.6 million DACA uh, dreamers to stay. No, that's, I mean, that's he's kinda, a yeah. dealer. Oh, no, let's put it this way. So the whole thing of the bridges or walls between Mexico and the US is totally linked to one factor and that is that Mexico is a superavitarian country, has a superavit vis-a-vis -vis the US in terms of trade, China, Japan, Mexico, and uh, yes, China, Japan, Mexico, and there's another one, and Germany, of course. Mm -hmm. But of course, Mexico is the neighbor, so it's the easy target, no? But actually, the, the largest target is really China. When you talk about where are the jobs that the US lost, 
th indeed, they did lose the jobs and they did lose the, the companies and the industry, especially the car industry, which went to Mexico and to China. So, but are these jobs going to go back because immigrants are going to go back home? No, because that, that's the point, you know, the point, as you said, is the, 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 the dreamers don't want to go back home. The U.S. already paid their, home. their education. <laughs> That's their home. They, the U.S. already paid for that educated people, and they are sending them... They are not going to send them back. Is What deals are they going to be made in, in, the, in the road? And, and I would say that... Let me put the example of another country that is not Europe, it's not the U.S., it's Chile, where I live. Chile is, is 17 million people in a very large country. They are not having children. So immigration for them is going to be the future at the end of the day. Who is going to be the social security? Who is going to uh, be the, 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 the support of social security for the elders in, in Chile? The migrants. Right. So what Chile is doing in a very intelligent way, they are receiving migrants legally. <coughs> They, they ask them to pay social security. They formalize them. They have a, a work contract. And I, we made a survey among the private sector, and we, we found out that there are certain sectors that prefer migrants. For example, the construction sector, they love the Peruvians. The sports business, they love Haitians. So, and, and for example, the service sector, they love Venezuelans. So it's very interesting to see where does the immigrants fit right. in terms of the sectors? In the case of the US, we can also do that. We are already okay. doing a study of where the migrants of Mexico and, and Latin America in general, because I agree with you, they are coming back now. They're not staying. And the reason why, and you may know this, that the reason why remittances are growing almost 20% last year is because they are afraid. Right. So now instead of sending 15% of their income, no. They're sending 50%, I don't know, much more uh, higher because they know they, are, they might be sent back. Right. And we had a conversation with Global Shapers, young uh, leaders from Latin America this week, and one of them from Venezuela was saying, uh, you know, <coughs> I, would, I, I wish that the World Economic Forum um, would hear our discussion about immigration, not only as, a, uh, as an example of the challenges that we face in Latin America, but also uh, uh, because of the solutions that we're coming up the local solutions that were coming up for, for immigration, for undocumented immigration, um, that, that, you know, that we get from other countries throughout Latin America. So, uh, going back to the concept of demographic anxiety, um, you, know, you, you live in a very progressive state like California, but still, especially in the last couple of years, we've seen sort of a, um, a, a backlash against immigrants, an anti-immigrant sentiment growing in the US, uh, which is something you've experienced personally. Yeah, I, I think this is a very interesting conversation and thank you so much for um, opening it up because um, <clears throat> right before I came, I was interviewing a lot of my friends who worked at large companies, corporations in Silicon Valley who are paid a lot just to stay and then companies are coming up with solutions to figure out how are they going to keep these talents because they're actually being negotiated right now by large companies in China, in Taiwan, in Mexico to be paid double just to come. And they're software engineers, they're, I mean, they're in healthcare, they're doctors, they're physicians, they're lawyers, and they're, they're contributing so much to the country. And what I found really fascinating was um, our US representative, Jimmy Gomez, shared with us that if, if they get rid of these 800,000 um, illegal children who are educated here, the impact that it has just on the state of California is over $12 billion loss in annual GDP. And I was shocked to hear that number, especially because I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. And so um, I go around and asking a lot of my friends about their stories. And shockingly, there's a lot of people who came here um, undocumented and they're in I mean, they're in so many nonprofit organizations and corporations working really hard. <clears throat> and so to me, I feel like there's, there's so much of misunderstanding and con um, perception around the, what's the, the demographic of undocumented and just immigrants in general. C correct. Uh, uh, Platon, going back to the wall and the border, mm -hmm. um, 
it's, it's, a, it's a common myth in the U.S. to talk about border security. And I say it's a myth because over the last 12 years, the U.S. has uh, invested over, I want to say invested, or spent over $100 billion on border security. They already have a 700-mile wall in a 2,000-mile border. Uh, 21,000 well-armed men, uh, security presence similar to the one the U.S. has between South and North Korea, drones, ATVs, high-tech surveillance equipment. So it's a pretty secure border, I would say. Um, and still, people say, you know, we need border security as a precondition to anything else, to any sort of agreement on immigration. But this border militarization platform has come at a great cost for border communities on both sides and for human rights, uh, for, for immigrants' rights. Uh, so sometimes even you know, at the cost of their, their, their own lives. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to personally find out what happens at the border. And uh, I heard that, you know, previous administrations had this policy that they would you know, sort of militarize the safe areas of crossing, but they would leave the most dangerous areas of crossing, assuming that people wouldn't want to cross that dangerous terrain. But perhaps what they underestimated was that uh, the people's commitment to cross the border, that many, uh, 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 it's that they have hunger, they can't feed their children, uh, in other cases, they're fleeing gang violence. So it's not always a choice to just go over the border for America. In many cases, it was survival for your family. So people were crossing the border. Uh, I photographed a guy. I don't, guys, I don't know if you can go to an image I have. This guy is called Mike Wilson, and he's a Native American. And uh, he lives in Arizona, and his land is the Tono Autumn Nation uh, reserve. And on his land, it's actually one of the most dangerous migrant crossings uh, on the US border. Many, many people die in this land. Um, in the summer, it reaches 115 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's devastating. So what he does is he leaves water out in the desert in specific areas for migrants who are starting to get weak from dehydration. Uh, to help them survive. Now, many of Mike's friends have criticized him for aiding and abetting criminals. And I asked him about that, about the moral complexities, and he said, there are two laws to choose from. There is a federal law, and he said, as a law-abiding citizen, I would rather be choosing the federal law. But there's another law as well that exists, which is a higher law of universal compassion. And he said, people are dying on my land. Families are dying on my land. And I can't watch them die. I, I have to give them water. So uh, what happens when you die? It's, it's, this, is, this is heavy stuff. I, uh, if you go to the next picture, um, you end up here in a morgue. This is the morgue in Arizona. And I stood in this room surrounded by about two or 300 bodies. And I'll never forget the smell of death. It's still in my head. Um, now, uh, within an hour of dying at the border, uh, you know, uh, over this dangerous terrain, your body starts to decompose. Within two hours, apparently, you're unrecognizable. So uh, if you go to the next picture, uh, I'd like to show you a picture of a lady. Uh, her name is Robin Reinecke. And what she does is she runs a project called Missing Migrants Project. Now, if you die on the border, you essentially uh, go missing. And your family, wherever you came from, have no idea what happened to you. This happens to children, too. So Robin uh, has decided to start gathering all the personal effects found on bodies. And she makes files of them. And then she matches those <coughs> artifacts with missing persons files and tries to help get families a sense of closure to identify their loved ones. Now, she's holding all the artifacts that she finds on bodies. And I asked her what kind of things she's found. I said, did you find guns? She said, no, I've never found a gun. She <coughs> said, I've never found a knife. I've never found drugs. So I said, well, what did you find? And she said, on one person's body, if you go to the next image, folks, uh, on one person's body, <coughs> all I saw was a watch. <coughs> they had their clothes, but the only personal effect they had was a watch. Someone else had a comb. Someone else had a toothbrush. 
Someone else had a wallet with $3 and some pictures of their children. Someone else had a cross or a rosary. And if you go to the last picture, I made a set of images of all the personal effects and I put them up as a, a line. Can you see? Yes, here we are. This is like a washing line of the dead. And, you know, the, each, each bag represents someone's life that was lost in the border. And the decisions policymakers uh, take on issues like immigration uh, have, a, have an effect on people's lives. And, and, and we see that through the, through the images. And, and, and those decisions, those solutions, is what I want to talk about right now before going to our audience and, and, and taking a few questions, because I think it's worth um, uh, having this conversation, of course. Uh, and, and in terms of solutions, I think the, 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 the bulk of the reaction has been on, okay, let's stop immigration. Let's figure it out. Let's just stop immigration and, and see how we can um, you know, uh, keep a, a minimal number of immigrants coming in, uh, trying to, to manage immigration. But we rarely hear about fighting the root causes of immigration. It's not as sexy. Politically, like you were saying, Alex, it's not something that uh, politicians can capitalize on, elect on, on elections. Uh, uh, because it takes probably longer, and it, it means in many, in many cases investing in, in other countries. The U.S. investing in Central America, Europe investing in Northern Africa, uh, and, and, and fighting the root causes of immigration, and recognizing there's a co-responsibility in creating the conditions for, for these people to leave their, their, their homes. Crime in Central America has to do with drug, drug consumption in the U.S. Uh, the, the instability in Northern Africa has to do in many ways with uh, how, how, how Europe uh, has behaved in that region of the world. So um, talking about the solutions, what works, what doesn't work, um, looking forward, Alex, uh, where should, should, should policymakers be, be focusing on? Well, I think there are uh, successful examples of uh, orderly uh, migrant programs. One, uh, for instance, that has been going on since 1974 between Canada and Mexico. Yes. Every year, Canada brings at least 25,000 agricultural workers from Mexico that can stay in Canada anywhere between two and eight months, and they have to go back, and next year they can apply again. And it's been going uh, on successfully since 1974. And this 25,000 Mexican uh, legal immigrants uh, in, in the uh, agricultural uh, fields in Canada contribute positively to the economy of Canada and of Mexico because they send remittances. Um, I think uh, one of the things we need to start looking um, uh, uh, going forward is to bring facts into this debate. I mean, this debate, um, as, as we said, is, is easy, uh, easily uh, overly uh, simplified and, um, and uh, you can use stereotypes. I mean, it's, it's just easy to oversimplify something that is actually more complex, but that there's actual, actual data mm -hmm. uh, that shows that, you know, for instance, the cities that uh, grew the most in the US between 1990 and 2007 were the cities that were more open to immigrants and that, have, uh, that grew more their share of immigrants in their labor force, namely Houston, Dallas, and Phoenix. And the cities that grew the least, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, and Detroit, were the ones that have um, uh, the lowest share of immigrants in their labor force. So, I mean, there's a lot of data that, that shows you know, that immigrants contribute to innovation. For instance, in Silicon Valley, you know, immigrants are around 15% uh, of the um, skilled labor force, yet they, they, they uh, represent more than 50% of the startups in, in uh, Silicon Valley and over 50% of the pa patents registered in Silicon Valley. So we have to bring facts to illustrate and to enlighten policymakers and the population in general to see the many good things that migrants bring uh, especially in orderly programs. And surprisingly, among the 10 cities with the most uh, immigrants in the US, uh, the, the ones that have the most um, positive reaction to, to their presence are uh, cities like LA, Chicago, New York, where that, that, that thrive through, through immigration and diversity. Uh, Mr. Ersek, one of the, the, the solutions that um, the US government has, has floated in terms of uh, undocumented immigration is taxing remittances. <laughs> Would that, would, would, that, <laughs> would that put uh, America look, businesses uh, first, or, or, or would that hurt American businesses uh, like Western Union? Look, I think money will flow anyway. Um, 
you know, if you tax remittances, then the people will find a way to send money, maybe illegal. And we don't like that. And nobody likes that, not a government, not a company, and not people. It should be documented, and we should send money for good cause, not for bad cause. So I think the remittances, taxing the remittances, it's, you know, it's not a good idea, and it doesn't work. In some countries tried, that never worked out, and it went always back on that one. And the other thing, as we're seeing, and I want to mention is that, you know, these people are human besides statistics. I give you some, some facts. U.S. is one, we talk a lot about U.S., but, you know, one of the things is Syrian refugees currently happened about. They're about, um, you know, what does a re uh, refugee do, as you mentioned earlier, for the human part? Either you die, they died about a, bill, a million people in Syria, or you go. You don't want to die. That's simple. And obviously, you don't want to die. You go. Turkey um, had 3.3 million immigrants, Syrian immigrants. Jordan, 1.2 million. Lebanon, 1.2 million. In Jordan, another example is Jordan was the fifth poorest water resource country of the world because they don't have a lot of water. So they really give people to water. Since they had that, you know, they hosted them, they said, okay, we're gonna give also water to the immigrants. And now they are the second poorest country, water resource country of the world. What they did is that they, with own citizen, they shared the water with refugees in cost of their own citizen. And this is something big. Solution-wise, it's quite complex, as you said. Some countries like Turkey did, okay, we have buffer zones on the refugee zones on the, on the border. We're gonna invest there. They invested a lot on SMEs, ask SMEs to invest there, produce, and hire Syrian refugees to produce good, to export them somewhere worldwide, to Africa or to Asia. And what happened is that they could not export them because they couldn't say it. Uh, they couldn't say it made in refugee camp, because they were in a buffer zone. It was not made in Turkey, was not made in Syria, and nobody would take the trade agreements. Wouldn't take that. So the, I think it's the situation is more complex than it looks like. It needs a global uh, global um, union here that we understand these issues. Sometimes um, we think it's easy. It's easy to build a wall. It's not easy to build a wall. And we know also the walls don't help to avoid problems. And I think we have to see that and go, go more uh, really case by case and solve this issue. And definitely, and, and it's an important distinction and I'm, I'm uh, thankful that you made it. People <coughs> sometimes link immigration to uh, opportunity. And that's the case for you know, people who voluntarily want to leave their homes and go work somewhere else. But in many cases, it's not about opportunity, but necessity. Surviving is a necessity. Fleeing violence, crime, conflict, or climate change. That's immigration that's born out of necessity. And that's what we're seeing more of around the world. So solutions to address that. And technology, I'll go back to, to you in a minute, Alicia. But technology has been a powerful tool, query in helping us uh, <coughs> incorporate the, the value of immigration into our societies. Absolutely. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about, for example, how you used Craigslist to hire people when you were uh, uh, creating a company yeah, in, in the U.S.? this over 10 years ago. And uh, um, technology platform really allows young people, especially I've been um, representing the voice of youth for almost 10 years. And it's really interesting how people think that we're part of the problem when, in fact, we are the part of the solution. Um, because we're the millennials and the, the incoming generation, the Gen Zs, um, <laughs> are actually innovative than ever. And they're, they're entrepreneurial. And they want to do something that actually matters, that has a purpose. And so it's, I think it's really interesting to see how these platforms like Airbnb or, um, I mean, like we travel around the world and it's so, it makes it so easy. Like I don't actually have to hire um, a designer within United States. Like, I mean, there's all these platforms that allows us to hire people from Indonesia to, you know, Eastern European countries. And it really leverages and flattens the world in a sense. And we kind of forget that we're immigrants because 
I mean, especially I'm, I'm part of the Global Shapers group and coming to Davos as a selected 50, uh, there's 40 country representatives around the world and we were just shocked sharing our vulnerable stories of what got us here and what, whose voice we're representing. We were just shocked by looking at each other how, wow, we're all sharing very similar stories no matter where we are. And having that technology on WeChat, on uh, WhatsApp, and, and just... Uh, you're being modest, and sorry to interrupt, because <laughs> you, know, you founded LifeGuide, which provides mental health services for people, you know, regardless of their you know, immigration status. Right, <coughs> and um, the healthcare system in the United States is not the most accessible, especially in mental health. Um, so our company goal is to bring mental health services as accessible as possible to underserved communities and around the world through technology, because it's such an taboo topic, but also a necessary um, industry that needs to be addressed. Thank you so much, I agree. And then Alicia, I'm sorry that you, you wanted no, to no, say no. something about um, no, what solutions. I wanted, yes, yes. I think that the most important one is to promote regular migration. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to make a distinction between migrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. And the treatment cannot be the same. We're talking about 250 million uh, migrants uh, and the refugees is a totally separate story. So uh, when we talk about Syria or we, you know, we're talking about a different story. Right. My, so because talking about the causes of migration, they are different from the costs of, from the causes of people, of large amounts of people moving from one place to another looking for refugee. Uh, for, and they want to go back, by the way. Right. Uh, migrants not necessarily want to go back. The refugees normally want to go back. And I have a story of Syrians that uh, were accepted, 40 families were accepted in Chile, 40, of Syria. They came to Chile and they were not adapted. They came to the UN to, make, to, to tell us that they don't want to stay in, in Chile. They don't know the language, they don't understand the culture, they want to go <coughs> back. So as soon as possible, they would like to go back. So that's a different part uh, of the story. And, and the other thing I wanted to say is that I definitely believe the private sector has a role to play here. Of course. I mean, uh, indeed, the governments have to come together. It's not a national problem, it's an international problem. And that's why we are on, on the global migration compact in the UN, working together with governments to find the solution. But the private sector has a very important role because they can identify, as you did, which are those migrants that you want. The companies know. They know much better than the governments many times what are the type of workforce they need and what type of people uh, qualified, even not qualified, that they would prefer as workers. You go to the US, you ask them, ask the companies, what do they want? And they will tell you, I want a Mexican. No, I prefer a Salvadorian. No, I prefer an Asian. I pre you see, they, they know what they want. And I think we have to bring them into the equation of managing uh, managing migration, I think it, it has to become regular, it has to become managed, it cannot be illegal. Migrants are not criminals by definition, and I think this is something that we have to definitely overcome. Migrants are not criminals by definition, no. Platon. And uh, sometimes images, perception can be deceiving about who, who, who the criminals are, who the migrants are, and then the narrative, the political narrative, <coughs> the political rhetoric um, also confuses uh, confuses people? You know, um, one of the biggest problems we face is persuasion. So um, I, I believe that if you can't see yourself in the story, then you are comfortably detached from it. Consequently, the people that you are discussing become dehumanized. And when someone is dehumanized, it's very easy to make a callous political or policy decision. And if you look back at history, whenever we've switched to the wrong side of morality, it's when we've dehumanized people. When people are humanized, and it could be your daughter, it could be your father, it could be your mother, your wife, then suddenly you see yourself in that story. And I think our goal is one of allowing everybody in this very complicated argument to see themselves in the story. And if they don't, then you can never really uh, make a compassionate but also rational decision. 
Now, um, I did do uh, a picture I'd like to show you where we're, we're talking about perception. Uh, farm workers exploited at work. Uh, the lady on the left holding the box with her hand on her heart, her name is Alina Diaz. She's the most courageous lady, perhaps, I ever met. Uh, she's now a citizen, um, and she campaigns passionately for women's rights who are farm workers. To my knowledge, there's a large percentage of farm workers in America who are undocumented. I even heard it could be as much as 50%. I'm sure my colleagues will be more accurate about that statistic, but it's a large amount. Um, and now when you're undocumented and you live in the shadows of society, you have no protection and you're very vulnerable. A dear friend of mine uh, works in the NGO community, and this lady is a, a great lady, and she said to me, and I respect her immensely, but she said, I don't think you should show people this picture. I said, why? She said, because the two ladies at the end have got bandanas around their head. They look like bandits. They look as if they're threatening. I don't think we want anyone threatening in a picture about immigration. Well, that horrified me, because this is from someone I admire, let alone from someone I fundamentally disagree with. The reality is that these women are wearing these bandanas because when they're working in the farms, they have no protection from pesticides and poisons. They have no protection at all, and they have to use a makeshift process of protecting themselves by just putting handkerchiefs and scarves over their mouths, and it's certainly not adequate. So the question is, the perception might be that they're threatening us. The reality is they're just trying to protect themselves and they're extremely vulnerable. These women are also wearing very baggy clothes. Uh, apparently, I mean, they told me that they don't wear tight-fitting clothes because it sexually arouses predators in the fields. And many of these women are raped and are subject to sexual violence, again, with no protection. If there's an injury in the farms, there's no insurance for health, so there is, there, there, there's no process of healing your body. So the lady who I know, Alina, she's a friend of mine now, uh, I said to her, Alina, what, what do you wish for? And she burst into tears. And she said something, and I wrote it down. And if I may, I'd like to read it to you. Please. So, Alina, what do you wish for? And as she wipes her tears, she says, I hope to die in my bed, finally seeing justice for these women. I want to die surrounded by all these women telling me, Alina, things are good now. We have rights. We have drinking water in our fields. We have a bathroom. They pay us fair. They don't rape us. They don't poison us with pesticides. We can speak out now without fear, and we can walk proud, and nobody is going to arrest us because we are a darker color. That is what I wish for. That's a powerful statement. It's a powerful statement, and I think it's um, an inspiring story uh, that, that you're sharing with us. Again, Tatum, thank you so much for doing that. <coughs> we have a few minutes, and I would like to use them for um, uh, questions from our audience, so if you can just uh, say who you are and, and the, the question for the panel. Thank you. My name is Yavr Shah. I'm the chairman of the board of SWIFT. I am an American, an immigrant. So we had a very good conversation on the economic benefits of immigration, the business benefits of immigration, the human benefits of immigration. What about the issue where people in Western lands are afraid that their culture, their religion, their way of life is threatened? How do we address that? Yeah. Uh, when I was referring to social and cultural um, um, components of this debate and the demographic anxieties, it, that's, <coughs> that's probably the, the most important part. I don't know who wants to tackle this. this, this can, I, can I just put one example that I have? We're very concrete. The largest diaspora of Palestine people is in Chile. Uh, that's the largest amount of people from Palestine that live abroad. And they came many years ago. They are now the most, the most successful entrepreneurs in Chile. They have a, a football camp. They have the food. Uh, and the culture really blended. It all depends 
on how, or, or what are you talking about? I also believe, for example, that the Mexican culture in the US has made a lot of uh, impact. Uh, I mean, I can say that you are from the, the, the movie sector, but there is one movie in particular that caused a tremendous impact, if I can say the name, Coco, no, that, went, that has been so successful. And it's about Mexico. It's about the traditions. It doesn't mean that, that you have to impose your traditions in the, in the country you're going to, but definitely you can contribute. So I agree with you that in religion is a different story, that again, the migrants have been stigmatized. Uh, there's like a, a stigma that if you're from the Muslim uh, region, then you're going to bring your, your, um, you're an extremist. That's the problem when we, when we put stigmas on top of the migrants. I think this is, this is a real problem. But the contribution in terms of culture, food, uh, singing, uh, art, uh, I think there's a lot of things that, can, that, that humanity needs to learn from each other without losing your roots. You know, you don't have to lose your roots to, to migrate. But, but it's a reality that, that immigrants are coming from cultures that are more distant and different and, and you know, Societies can only take so much change in a generation, Mr. Isaac. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a long-term issue, but I can give you from my own experience. My mom is Catholic, my father is Muslim, and I'm married to a Hindu. So it works in my case. <laughs> you you have one of those coexist stickers in the back of your yeah, car. I know, so it does, and we do celebrate. I mean, I am fortunate that I can celebrate more celebration than anybody else. <laughs> I get uh, presents here. but. It is a cultural long-term issue. That's an excellent question. It is. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, has that been as an integral part of that? One thing in the US, which I, you know, we, we, we talk about the US thing. One thing in the US, now I am there, what I like is the Thanksgiving vacation. It's the only vacation, regardless of your religion, where you come from, everybody celebrates. And normally what happens is that in the country, in Greece, <coughs> or in, uh, in Austria, you celebrate only one religion and, the, uh, you know, and that's it. And if you come with other celebration, people look at you in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I think there can be done some institutions. Germany is much more relaxed here. They do celebrate. Uh, Mrs. Merkel goes to a mosque, celebrate with the Muslim communities there. They have about eight, nine million Muslims in Germany, and that's new also. And it's nothing wrong there to just saying that I'm celebrating with my fellow Germans instead of I am celebrating with my fellow Muslims. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, because uh, the head of the state is head of the state, is not head of the religion. And that's something that we are really ignoring most of the time. Religion is an issue. We know that, you know, one other thing, you know, political, Turkey's application for European Union. It is definitely some economical thing. It has been about 35 years. Do you think that Turkey, if Turkey would be a Christian country, would be easy to join the European Union community? Probably yes. But it has been always delayed and delayed for other reasons, maybe also, maybe from political reasons also, whatever that is. But that was one of the main drivers, the cultural differences. So the one thing is also clear. We did a study, and I know that the multicultural, comp the migrants have a higher multicultural competency, and they be bring, as you, your point, multicultural environment. The other thing is also I want to mention, because you said Chile, my sister-in-law is a refugee from Pinochet. Her family got tortured to Austria, and she's now a doctor, a famous doctor in Austria, and she was a refugee. Now she's a migrant there and brought that also a part of it. So I think the, uh, it's a huge issue. By the way, last sentence. Sure. I'm, just, I'm shutting that up. I do, within my family, have the cultural fights every time. <laughs> Although it filled me extreme cultural competency, but you know, because of the different religions, because of the different environment, you have that all the time. So, which is a healthy one. And, and cultural competency is such an interesting term. I, I'm gonna have another question from my audience. Uh, if you can just raise your hand oh, in the back. Over here. <coughs> yeah, my name is Maren Peters from Swiss National Public Radio. I have a question for Mr. Ersek. Um, despite a pledge uh, given by the G8 countries in 2009 to reduce the average global transfer fees, uh, to 
um, they are still very high, up to 20 to 25 percent, um, dependent on the countries. What's your explanation for that? Sure. Um, if you look at I, very simple, um, you know, we are a uh, we are a private company, public traded company, and our goal is making money. And we won't be at the last mile of the uh, customers. We won't have 550,000 locations. We won't, we won't have one of the best anti-money laundering system of the world. We wouldn't invest uh, $250 million every year on, the, on the anti-money laundering systems. We wouldn't have five, five billion accounts worldwide if we wouldn't make money. And the, there are not other companies who can really serve these customers because we are serving that customer in the right way. If I would go only uh, on the high profitable location, only on that one, I wouldn't have 500,000 locations. I wouldn't be in the rural areas of Bangladesh. I wouldn't be Uganda or Sudan. I wouldn't serve the customers. That's simple. Um, and, and finally, a, a lightning round, and I know this is not easy. Sorry to put you on the, on the spot, but in one word, um, how would you describe immigration? And I'll start. Uh, from the middle with, with, with Baton, if you just had one word, I know you use images, not words, but in this case, if you can just describe immigration um, in, in one word, what, what word would you use? I'm an optimist, so I would say bridge building. Kiri. I'm, I'm, I share the same perspective. For me, it's really compassion, and it really, with working together, we can grow together. So Compassion. Compassion, like working together. When people move, good things happen. <laughs> I like that. Alicia. Solidarity. Solidarity. I use a verb, enriches, enriches countries and cultures. Perfect. Well, thank you so much to our amazing panel for sharing uh, your, your experiences and your opinions with us today. And, and to our audience, thanks again for uh, being with us this morning. And a round of applause for everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>